continuing passion of our Lord. They took Jesus to what was called Place of the Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh and gall, but when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. They crucified him there. At that time, they crucified two robbers with him, one at his right and the other at his left, and Jesus in the middle. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier, throwing dice for them to see what each one should get, and the tunic was left over. The tunic was without a seam, woven in one piece from top to bottom. They said to one another, let's not tear it, but let's throw dice and see who gets it. In this way, what the scripture said was fulfilled. They divided my clothes among them, and for my garment they threw dice. So that is what the soldiers did. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Pilate also wrote a notice. The accusation that had been written against him they placed above his head on the cross. It read, This is Jesus from Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many Jews read this notice because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Therefore, the ruling priests of the Jews told Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. The people stood there watching. Those who passed by ridiculed him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha! You who are going to tear down the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from that cross. In the same way, the ruling priests, together with the scribes and elders, were sneering and made fun of him among themselves and said, He saved others. Why, he can't even save himself. He should save himself if he is the Christ whom God has chosen. He is king, Israel's king. He should come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He has put his trust in God. Let God rescue him now if he so wishes, for he said, I am the son of God. The soldiers also made fun of him when they went up to him and offered him sour wine. They said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also were insulting him. One of the criminals who were hanging there was mocking him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other, warning him, asked, Aren't you afraid of God? You are condemned just as he is. Our punishment is just, for we are getting what we deserve for what we have done. But this one has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Now his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary from Magdala, were standing near the cross of Jesus. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near. Woman, he said to his mother, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his own home. It was about noon when darkness came over the whole land, lasting until three in the afternoon because the sun stopped shining. About three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
When they heard him say that, some of those standing nearby said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. After this, knowing that everything had now been finished, and to have the words of the scripture come true, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. Immediately, one of the men ran, took a sponge, soaked it in sour wine, put it on a hyssop stem, held it to his mouth, and offered him a drink. The other said, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, it is finished. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. After he said this, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the passion of our Lord. My dear brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus, God's grace, his mercy, and his peace be yours. From our almighty God, our loving God, our heavenly Father, his Son, our Savior, whose suffering, whose death we focus on this very, very special day. 
that God grant us his Holy Spirit to come upon us, to create that faith and keep that faith within us, now and until life everlasting. Amen. The words of our text come from the Passion narrative. It's Luke's account of it. Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. This is our text. I have confession, I actually have two confessions to make for you. First and foremost, um, this is my absolute most favorite service of all. And I've always enjoyed and appreciated it. And what I share with you is some of my memories as a child. And then I get to do some studying and I find out the historical significance of what we do this very special night and how far back it goes. And for me, that resonates and that makes it even more powerful and special that with Christians for centuries, for many, many centuries, more than a thousand years have done something very, very close, very close to what we do. It connects us, and, and I really, it has meaning. And part of my confession for this is the fact of I really worked hard to ignore all of you during this service. Because it is meant to be contemplative, and it's meant to draw us to that cross, cross where we see our Savior Jesus right there for me. And it's at this time that I want to just shut out the rest of the world. But I've come to find out that it's kind of interesting, especially when we hear when Jesus is dying for the world Still, how the life of the world goes on and focuses on that cross and makes fun of him. And so, to be honest with you now, I start to open up to all the sounds that go on around where I've been transported in time and I focus square on my suffering Savior for me, my sins as I live in a sin-filled world who doesn't even care. And I've got to enjoy it a little bit more because I'm driving back and forth and I get to see a world that doesn't care. That's helpful for me. That's the first confession. The second confession. This whole idea that I came up with about Silent Night, Holy Night, connecting it all together, I've never told anybody. But on this day is where I need to confess to you for the first, technically it's the second time because a couple hours ago I confessed for the first time this very fact. This beloved hymn that all of you like that you enjoy, that you sing, and maybe it's been a little strange to do it during Lent and now in Holy Week, and we're going to do it again. Think, seeing a Christmas hymn, I have to confess to you, I was not as much of a fan of this hymn. Now, to be fair, I like it. I like the melody and all of that, but I really focus on the words, and it makes no sense to me Sleep in heavenly peace. The picture and imagery that has always occurred was a memory that even all of you may have when we talk about sleeping in peace, or we'll say rest in peace. When I say those words, rest in peace, you know what pops into your head. I know what pops into your head. It's appropriate. It's actually, the word and phrase is written for today. And here's where I can all of a sudden go, aha, and then I started studying and working on this, and it's the fact of rest in peace. R-I-P. And I 
will maintain that most of you understand rest in peace. It will connect you to this day. It will make you think of death, grave, tombstones, right? I can't find it anywhere around here. I can't find the rest in peace. The R.I.P. In fact, I have to confess to you that when helping to make final decisions and plans for when my sainted father joined our Savior and all of God's saints in paradise almost three years ago now, and making his headstone, I didn't even put it on his gravestone. And yet, it is something that is very Christian. It's part of our worship. It's part of our liturgy. It's part of our life. And by the way, that rest in heavenly peace, that rest in peace is a sentiment that is isolated for Christians alone. Because you see, the peace we get is found at the cross of our Savior. It is not found with a baby in a manger. Never has been. And by the way, just so you know, I was able to go all the way back to the year 525 A.D. So if you like even a little bit of history, you should be geeking out with me right now. Because that's really cool. And it's in Latin. Which, by the way, if you use uh, the letters in Latin, you know what it comes out to be? R-I-P. Yes way. Does. In Latin. And in fact, what they used to do is they chiseled it into the stones. In Latin, the actual words that would translate the same way as rest in peace. In heavenly peace. For they saw a Savior, on a cross. And that's where the peace comes from. From their God. It makes no sense to sing this in a Christmas song unless you tie it all together from the birth to the cross. And yes, the open grave. We'll talk about that in a couple of days. Rest in peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. Jesus would even make comments like, Why, what is your problem? He's sleeping. People today have a hard time being able to separate death from sleeping. But we get it. We get it because in Christian faith, it has always been the foundation of who we are. That we know that this is not all that there is. And it is not going to be fear. It is not going to be anxiety. It is not going to be sin itself. There is not going to be worries or troubles that's going to come and separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what Paul writes in Romans. And then Jesus will say, and John will write it for you in his gospel lesson, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That's what we base our lives on. This is what we sing about. They are intimately connected all the way through. And right away in the first verse... Pastor Moore, who wrote this beloved hymn, all of a sudden, I love this hymn so much more because it finishes. It's not focusing just squarely on a birth, but it goes through the life of Christ and to his death and ultimately the resurrection. This is meant to be experiential, and I pray that it helps you see the peace the joy we get from a suffering Savior whose very words will come out to take care of you and me 
and all of mankind, that all who believe in him have that everlasting life. We should change the name of this day to Good Friday. Oh, wait, we do. It's so good. It's so wonderful because all that our Savior had to go through gave me total and complete forgiveness of all my sins and gave me total, complete heaven itself. So rest in peace. Sleep in heavenly Graciously behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus was willing to be betrayed, to be given into the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross. In Jesus' name. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, 
There they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed my, by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of the, these brothers of mine, you did for me. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise.
While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, Your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to them, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always 
to the very end of the age. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips.
Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. 